Engaging. Enlightening. Informative. This is WLOX News This Week. Well, hi, thanks for joining me and welcome to WLOX News This Week. 2023, a big campaign year here in Mississippi, statewide, county elections, all eyes really on the governor's race. Incumbent Republican Tate Reeves is seeking re-election, and we have the governor in the studio with us to talk about the issues and the campaign. Governor, I hope this is just another one of many appearances on WLOX between now and November 7th, and maybe even a debate between you and Democrat Brandon Presley down the road. Well, I will definitely be on the Mississippi Gulf Coast a lot over the next five months, just as I have been over the last three and a half years. Would you like to uh, debate? Uh, I'm sure, look, I, obviously we, we both have primaries coming up, and. Uh, should both of us uh, successfully get through those uh, primaries, I um, feel certain we're going to have a debate at some point and we'll figure out where we're going to do those. All righty. Well, you have chosen Mississippi Momentum. It's Mississippi's time as your reelection uh, kind of theme. We can't make this a political ad, but what do you think <laughs> are two or three of the most significant things that show Mississippi is on the move? Well, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the history of our state. We have more people working in Mississippi than at any time in our state's history. Our education results and our education attainment levels, truly they're talking about them all across the country and calling it Mississippi's miracle. In fact, even the New York Times this week wrote an article on it. And that's because in each of the last three years, our fourth grade reading results uh, are better than everyone else in the nation in terms of 10 year growth numbers. And our fourth grade reading results, 21st in the nation, whereas we were 49th just literally 10 years ago. And our fourth grade math, 23rd in the nation, whereas we were 50th just 10 years ago. Now, when we talk about Mississippi's economy, uh, the fact is we wouldn't be in this position without the $2 billion plus COVID relief federal money that's come into the state. I think you'd admit that. And for a fiscal conservative, and I think you consider yourself one, <laughs> laments federal spending all the time, but it's put Mississippi in a pretty good position. Well, I would submit to you that um, that most everyone would look at me as a fiscal conservative because I've been fighting uh, higher taxes and been fighting uh, against government spending for many, many years. Uh, there's no doubt that, that some of the federal spending that comes into the state of Mississippi uh, is, is advantageous to us when it comes to our overall economy. For instance, uh, you think about the military bases, for instance, that we have Kisa right here um, on the Gulf Coast critically important to our, our state's economy and the defense and aerospace industries are incredibly important as well. Um, obviously COVID brought uh, some extreme challenges and it also brought some extreme opportunities but the thing that COVID did more than anything for Mississippi's economy is it allowed us to show that Mississippi is open for business because our people got up, they went to work and they showed the world uh, that they that, that every job in Mississippi we view as essential uh, because it's helping someone put food on the table for themselves and their families. Let's talk about taxes. Uh, you have been a strong advocate for uh, eliminating the state income tax. Uh, lawmakers, particularly in the Senate, have been hesitant to pull the trigger on that. A, what do you think about that? And B, would you support something that is gaining a little bit of momentum right now, and that is reducing or eliminating the sales tax on groceries? Well, there are 50 states in the United States, and of the 41 that have an income tax, Mississippi now has the fifth lowest, and that's because we passed the largest tax cut in Mississippi history uh, in 2016, and then again passed an even larger tax cut last year. We reduced uh, the marginal rate from 5% to 4% at the top bracket. So we've made progress. But I also know that we compete every day for economic development and for people with Texas and Florida and Tennessee, all three of which have a competitive advantage against us because they have no income tax. And so uh, I'm proud of the progress that we've made, but we have more work to do. Um, when it comes to the um, eliminating the sales tax on groceries, um, I've said uh, many times in the past, I don't know that I've ever seen a tax cut that I wouldn't support. Uh, I do think it makes more sense economically and will help us grow our economy to eliminate the income tax because I believe that if you want more of more of something, you should tax it less. And so we need more income. We need to drive per capita incomes up in Mississippi. We need better paying jobs in our state. And one way in which to do that is to eliminate the income tax. You would be open, however, to supporting, uh, eliminating or reducing sales tax on groceries. I, I am open to cutting taxes of any sort. 
Alrighty, well, I've asked you about this already, and, and you know where I'm going with this. The story is not going away. It's the welfare TANF scandal, and everybody, your opponent is playing it up really big. Uh, the Jackson media is uh, playing it up uh, <laughs> uh, really big, and a lot of people are talking about it, and they try to tie you into it, and I want to ask you about two things. Uh, the contract Paul Lacoste got for a million dollars through this kind of dark web of TANF uh, uh, funding. Is he your personal trainer? Has, <laughs> has, did he teach you how to do jumping jacks, as Brandon <laughs> Pressey likes to say? Well, look, when you said um, uh, my Democrat opponent in the Jackson media, in many instances they are one and the same because some of those individuals in the Jackson media really work for a Democrat super PAC that claims to be journalism. Um, that's unfortunate, but that's what we deal with. And look, Republicans across the country have to deal with that. The fact of the matter is, on the TANF scandal, we inherited that. You know, if you go back and look at the individuals that have already pled guilty in this case, uh, every single one of them pled guilty to things that occurred between 2015 and 2019. I was sworn in, Dave, as you well know, on January the 20th of 2020. There has been no one that has put forth any evidence whatsoever uh, that I had any knowledge of anything that was going on Paul Lacoste, during this. Though, I, Paul Lacoste is someone that I've, I worked out with from approximately 2009 uh, until 2018, 2019. As I appreciate it, uh, we did have a, a meeting in the Lieutenant Governor's office. I've been very clear about that. Um, but he had been given this contract months and months and months before that. And so um, while I know some of the people that were involved and engaged, obviously I know Brett Favre as well. Uh, Brett was a pretty good quarterback. And Bill Bryan. Um, and I know Governor Bryan quite well. But again, I was sworn in January 20th of 2020. And in fact, it has been my administration through the Department of Human Services that is leading the civil litigation, suing literally dozens and dozens of people uh, with respect to this particular case, trying to recover the money that is owed the Mississippi taxpayers. Uh, we've been doing that for a couple of years now. Okay, one other question on that and then we can move on. Uh, Brad Pygott, uh was, uh, the Department of Human Services brought him in in 2021 as an independent kind of uh, auditor or investigator, fired him a year later. DHS does fall under the mm -hmm. realm of the executive branch. Sure. They work for you. Did you order or tell or suggest DHS to get rid of Brad Pygott? So the Department of Human Services hired uh, Mr. Pygott on a one-year contract in June of the prior year. They chose not to renew his contract, but instead, and, and Mr. Pygott was a semi-retired lawyer who was a sole practitioner, uh, instead they replaced him with a firm that has uh, 370 lawyers in eight states, including the District of Columbia. And those lawyers that they were hired at DHS have been attempting to sue the dozens and dozens of people that, that have, we believe, uh, received these funds uh, inappropriately. And so, uh, again, Mr. Pygott was replaced by a full service law firm because he was a single sole practitioner. Um, and we needed, uh, quite frankly, to bring more resources uh, to it. And so, you know, the, the other side and the Democrats who lie about uh, this case in its entirety and particularly about my personal involvement in it completely ignore the fact that the individuals that they claim um, that uh, Mr. Pygott was looking for, whether it was the um, USM Foundation or, or others, we're suing them. The Department of Human Services, it's, it's of record. We are suing them to recover these monies every single so one of them. So you feel you're clean? You feel like, I, I mean, even as Lieutenant Governor, you weren't aware that any of this was going on before being elected the, governor? The, the Lieutenant Governor does not run executive branch agencies. And so, um, of course, uh, I am clean. And of course, the Democrats are gonna lie, uh, and they're gonna lie, and they're gonna lie. And I think the people of Mississippi uh, can see the facts and know better. Medicaid expansion, you have not supported it. Uh, the legislature has not adopted it, but there's, it's still a big story and, they're, and it's trying to be tied to the health of rural hospitals and everything else. Could you ever see yourself accepting Medicaid expansion in the state of Mississippi? I do not believe that expanding Medicaid under Obamacare is the right approach for the state of Mississippi because I believe that we currently have approximately 800,000 people on welfare in the state of Mississippi and this Obamacare expansion would add an additional 300,000 Mississippians to welfare. Of those 300,000, I believe approximately a third of them, as you and I have talked about before, 
are currently on private insurance. And if those individuals move from private insurance to government-run insurance, the reimbursement rates for the providers even would be lower than they currently are for those 100,000. So um, not only is it bad for those individuals, I think it's ultimately going to be, would it ultimately be bad for the entire state. I'm wondering where you are on this. The legislature continues to fail to restore the initiative uh, process, giving citizens the right to petition government and get issues on the ballot to vote on. Are you disappointed in the legislature for, for having not delivered on that? Well, I think the people deserve access to the ballot um, when they cannot get their elected representatives to uh, listen to an issue uh, that is important to the people, then I think the people ought to have access to the ballot. Um, I will tell you, I don't think it should be easy. Uh, I think it should be a very high threshold. I don't think we should have a scenario in which one individual can, can come into the state and write a million dollar check or a two million dollar check, get something on the ballot, uh, and then be the only side telling the story because oftentimes, when, particularly when Democrats do that, they don't tell the truth. And so I, I do think it should be hard to get something on the ballot, but there should be access to the ballot. And I think the legislature should pass that. And one last question, because time has just flown right by, and it's a coast uh, question for you. You know, because you are intimately involved in BP money projects down here, Go Mesa oil lease money, even Tideland lease money, working with DMR and our local legislators. But you also know there are lawmakers in Jackson and upstate who would love to get a hold of that money what can you tell our viewers in South Mississippi and the voters down here about making sure that money stays right here? Well, for years and years and years, I have been the guy in Jackson that said every penny that belongs to the coast is going to be spent on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. I have delivered on that promise. Meanwhile, my most likely Democrat opponent, you know, Democrats in Mississippi have a, really in America, Democrats have a hard time with border policies. And I really think that my Democrat opponent thinks the southernmost border of Mississippi is Highway 82 because he never comes down to the coast. I don't think he even knows what the issues are important to the coast. In fact, he came on your show and did a Zoom from somewhere not on the coast. He'll be on the show. He's going to come back on the show? Well, yeah, good. I think that's great. Yeah. I think that's great. But the reality is I have fought for the coast every day as governor, and I will continue to do so. All righty, Governor Tate Reeves running for re-election, of course, um, uh, kind of primary coming up in August, but I think everybody, the presumption is the conventional wisdom will be you and Brandon Presley uh, meeting in November. Governor, good to see you, and thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Dave, appreciate it. And stay with us, we'll be right back.